Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Life After COVID. It's great to have you here. This is our second offering of our free summer course here at the University of Mary Washington. Uh, we're delighted to have you with us. We have a large group here uh, for these this uh, class. We have 650 uh, people registered in the class. 350 of them are UMW students, both continuing students and incoming first year students who are starting at Mary Washington in the fall of 2021. So it's exciting to have so many students with us, but I'm also really happy to invite, uh, welcome all of the community members that are with us. We have a large group of alumni, uh, faculty, staff, parents of current students, and friends of the university, community members who are just uh, friends of the university. So welcome all of you to Life After COVID. We're excited to be doing this course for you. Um, I wanna start by just thanking everybody who made a donation when you registered for the course. Um, as you all know, those donations are all going in to support um, a fund for high impact student learning experiences. And so they are put, being put to very, very good use and we appreciate it very much. I also wanna extend a, a very sincere thank you to Kathy and Tom Wotecki. Kathy is an alum of a, the class of 1969, and she is matching all the gifts to the endowment from now through the end of July, which is just a very generous offer from Kathy and Tom Wotecki. So thank you all very much for that. Um, uh, finally, just some housekeeping. You'll see at the bottom of your screen that we are in the Zoom webinar environment, and you are going to be able to click on a Q&A icon at the bottom and also a chat icon. The Q&A box is designed for the speaker. So if you have questions that occur to you during the presentation, feel free to go into that Q&A box and type out your question. Those questions will appear to everybody else who's an attendee in the session. So you'll all be able to see the questions. And if you see a question that you like, you can give it the familiar thumbs up uh, vote. So go ahead and upvote the questions that you like because the questions that get the most upvotes will be asked first when we get to the Q&A session in about a half an hour. Finally, for the uh, chat box, if you have technical issues, feel free to leave a note in the chat box. Those can be seen only by the panelists, so by myself and by my colleagues who are facilitating the course with me. So let me introduce myself now that I've forgotten that for the last two minutes. My name is Keith Mellinger. I'm the Dean for UMW's College of Arts and Sciences, and I'm delighted to be one of the facilitators for the course. Uh, with me tonight is Dr. Anand Rao. Uh, he's a professor, but also the chair of the Department of Communication and Digital Studies, and also Betsy Lewis. Dr. Betsy Lewis is the Assistant Dean for the College of Arts and Sciences, and we're delighted to have her with us as well. We'll come back on after the presentation at the end and moderate the Q&A uh, with all the questions that appear in the Q&A box between now and the end of the presentation. So let's get right to it. Uh, we are very happy to welcome today uh, Professor Dan Wolf. He's a lecturer in the College of Business. Uh, he has an exciting past before he came to us here and he's gonna share with us how the pandemic has affected business. And so without any further ado, let me turn it over to Professor Dan Wolf. Dan? Thank you, Dr. Mellinger. Um, hey, everybody, welcome. Uh, it's good to have you aboard. Uh, for the next half hour, we're gonna talk about um, how COVID has affected uh, a lot of business practices, uh, not a lot, everything. It's touched everything. Uh, this past semester, I taught a seminar on COVID and the impact on our uh, everything, entertainment, travel, um, all aspects of business world, including um, uh, the restaurant business. I had, I had speakers in this past semester from the theater business, uh, the studio side of, of the entertainment world, also uh, travel, leisure, everything involved with that area. So as we move forward, it's anybody's guess. Uh, we're seeing trends that are, are happening, uh, but we're seeing trends about uh, what these last 14, 15 months have meant. We saw what happened over this past Memorial Day weekend with crowds back out, the need to interact, the need to have that social uh, interaction that's been missing for so many months, actually missing over, over a year plus. Uh, let me go ahead and share the screen with you. Uh, and let's go from um, just, just some touch points, but I, I love this quote. There are decades when nothing happens and weeks when decades happen. Because when you look at something like this, 
especially COVID and what happened. And, and a lot of talk about this has never happened before. Uh, this is something unique, something new. Uh, in my mind, it's not true. I mean, we've had outbreaks. We've had basically pandemics in the past, not in our lifetime or my lifetime, but they have been there. And from a standpoint of uh, what has happened after these, uh, after situations like this, one thing you notice more than anything is really, I see as an acceleration of basically what was already happening. It's, a, it's accelerate the environment of things that were going on. If I talk about entertainment, uh, we already talking a little bit about streaming. What did COVID do? COVID accelerated the, uh, the need for streaming services. It shut down other aspects of the entertainment business, but accelerated uh, how much growth there was. Look at something like Disney, which grew over to 100 million subscribers in a record time. Uh, they were expecting that over a three-year window, and it happened over basically a one-year window. So you look at things like that, you look at things that don't make sense. Why the stock market shoot up so high in the last, after the initial drop when COVID came out, when everything shut down last March, why did it then go the last 12 months such extreme heights? So the things that in a lot of ways don't make sense and everybody's gonna be prognosticators about what's gonna happen in the future. But let me talk, let's go with, um, start with, uh, back to what's to use in history. Cause I always like to look at history and look at that from a standpoint of how it determines uh, our future, how it determines um, because everything has the past. And I know we can look at this as something unique but you look at like the Spanish flu and you look at the Spanish flu killed five, 50 to hundred million people. It's hard to keep records back in those days, 1918, 1919. But what was it? I mean, what the different things that came out that just affected us from a standpoint we look at it, you know, influenza, what things you had to do, you know, do not take any person's breath, keep, you know, wear a mask, things that you do that basically started um, uh, the pandemic back then. What happened after the two years of the Spanish flu? Well, we went into a depression. I mean, we went into basically the Great Depression of 2000, um, I'm sorry, 1920, 1921. Uh, and then after that was 10 years of amazing growth. So there's a lot of things that we can look at. Uh, bringing pictures up to you, and let me make a, hold on, make, make adjustment really quick. Okay. We look at things from a standpoint of things we've seen before, going to a ball game, wearing masks, things that were shut down. Now, part of the Spanish flu, there was four waves to it. It infected 500 million people worldwide. Um, but what happened, like I said, after that fact, we went into the depression. We don't see that happening now, but then there was 10 years, like I said, of great growth. And it was such a great era of growth. You look at some of these, I, I love putting these up, but you know, masks must be worn by all during the epidemic, or they police raid a saloon because of um, keep church windows open. Things that you've seen before. Now I bring up some COVID, 19, uh, COVID-19 scenarios. And these are scenarios that came out last spring. And these are major economic variables. So from either ro robust to recovery, which is a bull market, to a bear, which was deep scars. Will things go back to normal? Is it going to be a new normal? And I always like that word, a new normal. Because things, from what I see, are going to change. And they're continuing to change. And I think there's change that will really focus on just certain areas. I bring this, this first up, this base case. So navigate new normal. Uh, one of the things they put was subdued uh, near-term productivity growth, lower capital expenditures, and higher unemployment. But they're saying higher employment levels through 2025. What we're seeing, we'll talk about in a few minutes, about higher unemployment levels uh, that we've had to go through. But there's a wave of you, if you look around you now, of for, for you know, help wanted sides. What's needed? Now, people are switching gears and we're seeing a switch from people going from basically uh, leisure services, which include hotels and restaurants, and changing their careers because they realize that it's too, uh, there's, there's too much risk factor involved. And they're taking this time and this ability to go ahead and say, now's the time for me to switch gears and to go into another area. And you're also seeing maybe not being as much need in the area of restaurants and hotels as we become more automated with things. When you go into a restaurant, you're seeing, especially quick service restaurants, where you're seeing you're, you're going on a computer and typing in your order. 
And you're going to continue to see that as we go along. The other thing I thought was interesting about that, we see single family housing, rentership ownership, and more people working from home. And people are, are if, you're, if you haven't looked at the housing market, things are being taken up right away. Housing markets uh, basically at, at one of the all times high and there's inventory is at all time low. So people have decided either it's time for me to buy a house, it's time for me to get away from the apartment structure, but you're also seeing exodus to the suburbs. We'll talk about that shortly. A base case plus of getting back to normal is that there's gonna be some, some risk involved, uh, but that you know consumers and businesses are really having a more of a positive look. Uh, and then the bull case, which is a robust uh, recovery, was our unemployment levels falling back to 3.5, which was basically where we were before COVID. Uh, and then inflation rate rising just 2.5 and productivity growth as high as 2% because of higher workforce engagement and technology improvements. So there's a lot of things that are gonna be occurring in the next 12 months as we go along. Um, I talked about this a little bit earlier, how the stock market emerged. And what has really come out of this, the stock market is the disparity between the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer. Uh, people are doing quite well, obviously, in the stock market. People have stayed in the market, but it's increasing wealth among a certain uh, social class. And then the poor are actually having more troubles and some of the social uh, levels that are involved with all this. So I look at three sets of sustainable trends. Uh, what came out of all this. One was the accelerated shift to remote work and virtual meetings. The second one was e-commerce and other digital transactions. So we look at this from a standpoint of even us older people got into the e-commerce more, got into shopping online. My parents who are in their 80s are now used to shopping online, something they didn't really do before. So you're seeing the e-commerce, you're seeing people becoming really um, used to doing digital transactions. And that will continue as we go along. And the last thing is automation and artificial intelligence. And this is really such a growth area. And along this line is that we finally have entered, even though we've been in a digital world for a while, COVID has reminded us that we needed to automate more. We need to get to a much more automated level and the use of uh, artificial intelligence, the use of areas that we can go and use technology to make things less interactive, on a physical level and much more from a digital standpoint. Um, the more advanced the economy, the greater its potential for remote work. Now we've been playing with this in, 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 the, in the world I was in for several years, the entertainment world. Um, we always talked about allowing, our, allowing people to go to much more of a, uh, a remote work environment, but we never made that move. We never felt like, oh, we need to have everybody in the same room. Well, what really COVID has shown is that yes, it could work. Not only could it work, that it could really prosper, that we can all get together and work remotely and yet still uh, get the work done, be productive. Because the realization is that how much time do we spend in a car per day? I know I spent living in LA, I spent an hour and 15 minutes each way going to work. That's two and a half hours a day in a car. Now, productivity might be being on a phone still, but that's still a worker spending that much time. And it makes for their day being much more of a longer day, a 7 a.m. to maybe a 9 p.m. Takes away from family time, takes away from other things that will really continue to keep a worker or an employee happy. And what we're seeing is happier employees. So this, this advance in coming, going for potential work. And why the shift to remote work? The, the argument is now that 20, 25% of workers can work from home three to five days a week. You compare that to 5% in a pre-pandemic world. The other thing that's really gonna affect is business travel, that we will decrease business travel by 20%. And, but look what that affects. Less business travel means less uh, time uh, in airports, spending expenditures for, within airports, flights, travel to, to areas, Rental cars, hotels, restaurants, all the things that you think of with a reduction of business travel, how much that will affect the economy and how much it will affect the economy from a standpoint in major cities. So we look at things that will really affect by this pandemic, we'll see this continue to, to be a, a major issue as we move forward. 
Another issue is people moving from cities. And the people are moving from cities to suburbs and small towns. This is a, a breaks a 10-year trend. We were seeing, except for areas like LA, we're seeing where more people were moving into big cities, younger people moving into big cities. As older people and people with families were moving out of cities to the suburbs, we're seeing young people move in. Well, we saw these last 14, 15 months, this breakaway. But has this breakaway just come from the last year? Has it or has was there already a shift in place? Now, in research, you see that there was a shift already in place where people were leaving the cities. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes, about why that might happen. But this is a 10-year trend that's broken. And I think it will continue to be people living out to the suburbs of small towns. And I have one theory about why that's happening. But we'll talk about that in a second. And it's estimated that up to 33% of U.S. jobs may be vulnerable, with more than 80% being held by low-income workers, which means we have to retrain a workforce. We have to retrain a workforce. And a lot of these low-income jobs or low-paying jobs by low-income workers are happening in the service environment. They're happening in the restaurants, the hotels, uh, areas like that, that we will have to retrain our workers and as we move forward. With thing, uh, this thing called urban exodus, and that's a, the population shifts away from major cities. And you're seeing population shifts downward in New York, San Francisco, LA, Philadelphia, international in Paris, Tokyo, London, Hong Kong. But this migration started before COVID. And what happens is in a, in a situation like a pandemic, it accelerates any type of trend that you're seeing. It has a tendency to accelerate anything that's going on. I talked about earlier about streaming and I talked about how streaming was starting to happen more and more. Obviously Netflix was the leader and other groups were starting to come into it. But over the last year and, and so many months, um, you had an increase of everybody's streaming sites up to five. The average was about five streaming sites. We've seen a trend already happening in the last month where now we're averaging about 3.5 uh, streaming sites per user. And that is, they're already dropping. They're looking at their bills and going, you know what, I'm getting back out. I don't have as much time to look at uh, content. Uh, the, early, the early news back from theaters was that theater this the past weekend, we saw a huge uptick. We saw a movie, um, Silent, I forgot the whole name of it, I should know this by now, but we saw a movie this past weekend making 60 million. We saw movies that are shifting upwards. And if you asked this a year ago, it was the death of the theaters. So we're starting to see shift back to some normalcy. Now, will that be continued or will that continue to go? Uh, as we move forward, we'll have to wait and see. But this migration away from cities is part of the result of, I think, COVID, but also things are happening before, but also part of um, a, a certain audience. Now we look at something like this and we look at proximity is now a consideration where we work, how we work, what skills we need and what organizational culture we need. And it is gonna be a decision. Most younger people wanna work no further than 15 minutes away from, uh, from where they live. And you've got groups like West Virginia, uh, remote workers, offering remote workers to get paid 12000 to move to West Virginia. You'll start seeing maybe more cities like this. Now, you've seen a huge growth rate in cities like Utah, Idaho, Texas, North Dakota, and Nevada. They've experienced rates of 15% or more of growth. So these cities are doing quite well. Well, you're seeing a downtick in cities besides major cities, cities like West Virginia, Illinois, and Mississippi. You're seeing this where cities are starting to realize we need to go ahead and we can go after these remote workers because the, the difference now is people are now looking to work outside of their environment, outside where they've been typically, and hopefully in the future continue this trend. Now, the other big thing I think there hasn't been enough talk about is the impact on small businesses. So it's estimated that 34% of small businesses are still close. And you realize that 99%, actually it's 99.9% .9 of businesses in the, in the US qualify as small businesses. And these small businesses account for 40% of all jobs nationwide. And what we're looking at is a possible K-shaped recovery. And you're seeing this because it's affecting everything in our life, not just our business world. It splits economy in two. So the divisions that start occurring along class, racial, 
geographic industry lines. Now, usually you'll see a division occurring across one of those. But in this case, you're seeing across all four areas. Why? One time, people have had a chance to sit back. People have now are not caught up in the, in the, in the hustle and bustle of basically being a work environment. A chance to rethink their life, to rethink things. Um, and it also, this does exposes pre-existing divisions and disparities of wealth, the haves and the have-nots. So you're seeing this K-shaped recovery, which I think will continue happening. And what areas are impacted? Um, most affected by COVID, impacted obviously in the retail, leisure to hospitality, obviously, restaurants, hotels, cruise lines, things that affect all these areas. Construction business. Uh, if you haven't noticed, the cost of wood has gone up 300% uh, since the pandemic started. We're seeing, so you're not seeing new construction happening. You're seeing much more people involved with uh, their, their own home, doing construction work in their home. You're seeing people buying up existing properties. Um, travel and transportation, the entertainment business, and most areas affected entertainment except for streaming. Um, and that's not just with uh, live action, concerts, movies, business, entertainment sectors, everything involved in that. Personal services, dry cleaners, things like that, that, that were most effective. People aren't going and needing dry cleaners like they used to. They're not wearing, they're now wearing shorts all the time or sweats at home. So the need for uh, personal services is not what they were. Manufacturing, you saw a huge impact on manufacturing. You saw a huge impact on the supply chain and how the supply chain has been affected, <coughs> that has been affected from a standpoint of what availability of goods, people working in the factories, the food availability, prices have gone up on food, and then the self-employed, these are most affected by COVID. The areas that have thrived during COVID, cleaning services, obviously, delivery services, grocery stores, liquor stores, because now instead you can't go to a bar, so you're, you're bringing it home. Uh, tech companies are thriving. All the things that can help with in-home offices, offices from home, connectivity, the ability to connect and work from home. Obviously, the home fitness equipment has been thriving. Gyms are suffering, home fitness, and, and you're seeing the ads for all that. And then telehealth services and also streaming channels, all thriving during COVID. We look at what I think is creating this change, and I think will continue this change is millennials. So you look at a millennial born between 1981 and 1996. So right now that's age, uh, age, age 40. So that millennial just turned 40 all the way down to age 25. Now they've received a lot of grief over the years, millennials, they really have, in terms of they're lazy, they're this, they're not interested in things, well they are. They're interested in a lot of things, but they're interested in different things. It's now the largest age group in the US workforce, age 25 to 40. They'll soon outnumber baby boomers the 1946 to 64, the group that was responsible for change every cycle as we go forward since they were born. So guess who's taking this over? Millennials. They're the next logical group come out of this that are following the baby boomers. And they will affect change as they move forward from age 25 to 40 as they continue through their, their life cycle. They outnumber Gen X, the 65 to 1980. So they're responsible for revolutionizing the economy they're much more interested in the balanced lifestyle. They're very much about cultural shift, transform social media. Yes, the use of social media sites and use of interactions through social media. And now they're starting to change politics. And you're going to see a shift as we go in forward into the politics area. But millennials are creating this change. And what's creating more change outside of COVID is there is their idea of what what work balance life should be. It's not about anymore working all night. What you're starting to see, and you're gonna see how this with millennials is these micro communities. And these are some uh, trend-driven opportunities, but micro communities are what we call 15 minute cities. The idea being that everything within reach should be within 15 minutes away. You're gonna see these micro communities really evolve from a standpoint of, um, the ability to walk downstairs to a coffee shop, the ability to have a couple of restaurants right there. Uh, you're starting to see these in areas as they're being built. Uh, and really much more of a standpoint of, um, especially as the younger uh, population, the 20s going into 30s. And then what you're seeing the trend 
moving outside the cities as uh, millennials have children. But really, this micro community idea is something that's really starting to see, and, and you're seeing more cities. It's just like you saw with baby boomers entering the over 55 communities. That idea was a shared, uh, much more uh, neighborhood of, of, of people over 55 uh, to live in that kind of environment. But micro communities are basically giving you everything, giving you everything you need without having to get in a car. And a lot of these tech trend-driven opportunities are coming online. Panda moment, I'm sure you heard that word before, but it's basically people on the planet, putting people on the planet first. It's not about the bottom line dollar. It's about creating a balance again. Mental wellness, it wasn't talked to about for so long. We're now bringing it to the forefront of, of issues of people's well-being. It was a taboo subject that you didn't talk about before. One interesting thing I think is Old Spice. And if you're in the entertainment industry and you hit 50, you were considered the old. And I'm 58 now. And all of a sudden, you realize that you're, you're in an old environment. It's now looking to bring older people, 50 and above, back into the work environment because of expertise, their balance, uh, and the need to have balance in a workforce. Uh, because we've seen a trend about older generations being pushed out. Systematic justice, which we've seen in our environment now, uh, righting wrongs, things that have happened in, in terms of based on race, on, on uh, social class, we're seeing a, a redevelopment of systematic justice. Planted, uh, which is basically plant-based food. We're seeing that trend. Uh, norm recalibration, and that is basically acceptance. Acceptance of um, along different lines, whether, whether you're transgender, whether you're gay, uh, whether you are even from a standpoint of um, looking at this from a standpoint of uh, a interracial marriage. We see much more advertising, <coughs> excuse me, come a little cold, much more about advertising now that is much more representative of our society, that it doesn't show, that now shows our population. It shows the realities of population. And that's something that I think that we've been lacking in the, in the past, especially coming from an advertising standpoint or marketing standpoint. Earth positive, again, just what it is. It's about basically treating this earth differently and really balancing and, and, and going with companies that are very much about uh, uh, taking account the earth and how we do it. Then lab to table. New things are coming out now about uh, lab induced meat. So yes, lab induced meat. So you're looking at it from the standpoint, uh, they just tested this overseas, chicken uh, created from a lab. So these are all things that you're seeing trend driven opportunities. Um, this quote, this last quote, we will see more change in the next 12 months than we saw in the last 12 years. And I think it's true. And I think the biggest change that we'll see, and, and we could focus on a lot of different areas, Unfortunately, we live in a world where a lot of times change is forced upon us. We're not ones to go ahead and create change. So when something drastic like this happens, like COVID, then we turn around and we take a step back and we, we, we look to ways that we can change and look to ways we change. And believe me, with any business, you have to adjust. You have to change. Now, I remember back when we first started from an analog world, uh, which was film. Uh, in the, oh, I worked for Universal Pictures. We were in an analog world with film and we're switching over to digital. I had a number of editors that said, I'm not changing, I'm staying in this world. I'm not gonna stop cutting on film. And I remember giving them opportunities to go ahead and take classes and some did and some didn't. And something that was gonna take five to seven years to eventually change, it changed in two years. It accelerated that quickly. And we're operating with technology in a world where things are changing much more drastically than they ever have before. And in order for you in a working world to stay on top of change is the ability to change, the ability to see what's happening, see the trends that are happening, and the ability to adjust. It's surprising to me how many employees would say to me, I'm not changing. Well, if you don't change, you don't evolve. And basically, uh, you're going to be out of, work, out, of, out of your job. And that's what's happened in the, in the entertainment business. Those that made the adjustments, made the change to the digital world, continued on and prospered. Those that didn't fell off and they switched careers. 
So you look at, or, or they moved on to something else. So you look at world where change is important and something like this, something drastic like this only accelerates trends that we saw. You know, we saw trends that were already happening, uh, and but this has pushed things along so much quicker than ever before. Thank you for joining me. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, I apologize for my voice going. I've been feeling bad cold and everything, but thank you for joining me. And uh, we look forward to continue this series of the next several weeks. Uh, and I'm sure you have tons of questions to ask as we move forward. Thank you. Well, hello, everybody. My name is Anand Rao. I'm a professor of communication and chair of the Department of Communication Digital Studies here at the University of Mary Washington. And uh, thank you to Professor Wolf. What a thought provoking, really excellent presentation. And there's so much ground to cover uh, that he's already covered and some really excellent questions. I'm, I'm happy to kick off the Q&A. And so, Dan, let me ask you the first one. You know, you noted a number of trends that we're seeing that sometimes seem counterintuitive. You know, on one hand, you said that there's a suggestion that we'll have, uh, you know, elevated levels of unemployment over the coming years, maybe through 2025. But at the same time, small businesses are having trouble finding staff. And so the first question we have is regarding this, and we're seeing nationwide pressure, particularly in the service industry, mm -hmm. for entry level uh, workplaces struggling to find employees, could you elaborate a little bit more on what the causes of this could be? And how do we expect to see this phenomenon evolve over the coming years? I think, well, a couple things are happening. One, and I don't want to, I really avoid politics. So, but one thing is um, the, a lot of the extension of, um, of unemployment till September. And I think that now you've got about 20 governors trying to change that already in states. But if you look at it and say, if I'm, am I receiving $700 a week and I go back to work, and I receive 650. Why am I not going to stay on unemployment until, until I have to? So I, we had one of the speakers I had in was uh, Virginia Beach uh, Tourism, actually two speakers, one for the restaurants and one for uh, hotels. And they both were pleading to my class, if you're looking for a job, contact me. And a couple of them did. But that is a, a big issue is that. Um, and also the other thing that's happening is people use COVID time to say, I need to rethink myself. I need to really rethink the direction. I, I'm in an area that now can serve volatile that I was one of the first to lay it off because of restaurants closing and hotels. And, and that's another issue is that people are saying, I need to get out of this type of sector and get into something else. So you're seeing a combination of those two things. And it, it's probably going to be affected all the way through the summer. It really is. I mean, I've never seen so many help wanted signs out. It is, I live just down here in Virginia Beach. So. Okay, hi everybody. My name is Betsy Lewis and I'm a professor of Spanish and an assistant dean at the College of Arts and Sciences. So I'm excited to answer or to ask, not to answer um, the next question. And it has to do with pent up demand. Um, what do you think? Um, uh, do you think there is going to be um, a lot of demand um, for things like big companies like Disney, visiting Disney? And also, I'm going to add to that question, kind of a follow-up, is um, how do you think it might be different than it was before COVID? Well, I, think, I mean, from an entertainment standpoint, I think, I mean, every time you look at theaters have been under scrutiny, every time you go back decades to something like the like um, theaters, and when when color TV came out, it's going to be the death of theaters. When, when uh, the VCR came out, it's going to be the death of theaters. So it's always been, but people, the need for entertainment, the need for social interaction, they're starving for it. So I think you'll, I mean, a company like Disney is so well suited for the ability to, uh, to bounce back. And in fact, if anything, their stock has shot up high during COVID because of their streaming. So their ability to use, um, I, I think we'll see much more, uh, like in Disney's case, the old way of Disney, which was much cleaner environment much cleaner, they were cutting corners, Disney was, for example. And I think you're, you're looking at basically cleaning services that will stay at the forefront. I think, I've never seen airports as clean as they have been. So you look at along those lines, people are demanding this more and more, that that's what they're continue. I think you'll see, I remember the days when I used to see someone wear a mask and think what was wrong. I now look at it as like going, people, you know, certain people will wear a uh, little more germs and everything, but I think that you'll still have some of those things in place. 
Great. Well, I have the next question, Dan. Uh, there's a really great question uh, that there's a, a lot of ground to cover regarding communication. And as we've worked remotely, uh, both in education as well as in the business, uh, in the workplace, and, and you noted the, the rise of remote work, you know, there's a question about how do we adapt our communication styles. I, I will note that we do have a session coming up on this regarding communication practices and how they've changed because of COVID. But Dan, I'd like to, to turn the question a little bit to, to get you to elaborate on how remote work has changed the way we communicate and maybe are there ways that as you view this as a business professional, as somebody in a college of business, do we need to do a better job of training students, high school and in college to adapt to remote work, to be able to communicate more effectively? Well, I think what's interesting is the, the big adaption uh, to adapt to this was really, to me, the older generation. I think we had a harder time adapting. Now, a combination of both is what's going to work. I, I worry about the culture. If you look at businesses, that need for culture, that need for interaction. Now, one thing I read an article about this was that what happened in a culture of a, of a business, I look at the entertainment business, there was always a, a, a kind of a social class. You had the people at the main table, and then you had the other people that sat around on the outside. What Zoom allowed everybody to do is be on an equal level. And it allowed it to be much more equal. And I think it also made people a little more human. If you're at on your Zoom call and then the, uh, your child walks, it comes in the room. Things that made it a little more a human nature. And I think that's what's been effective about it, frankly. Now, there's, some, there's definitely drawbacks. But I definitely think this will allow for much more um, understanding the human element, understanding that people have to balance the work plus home. And people would talk to you, but now you experience it. Now you can experience someone with their child walking into a room. It brings much more human element into it. And I think that's what works about the ability for remote. Do I think it's, it's, it's as effective as being in, a, in, in an office or being in a conference room? It depends. It really does. I do think the fact that you're eliminating two hours a day on a commute time or an hour and a half a day on a commute time then obviously right away it makes people much more uh, effective in, in that environment. So it is, but I think it's going to be a combination. The ability to work from home maybe three days a week in the office two days a week, which we didn't get into what that mean for, for retail space or what that mean for, for basically consumer space. You know, you obviously don't need as much office space as you did before. You're able to work in a different type of way. So, uh, but I do think the long run, uh, I think it makes a happier employee. And that, to me, makes a much more effective employee. So, yeah, I I think those are some of the biggest challenges we face at the university as well as figuring that out. I, I know we we had um, a big, uh, we call it UMW Academy, a big event that happened several weeks ago, and we had an attendee who was in Jamaica, who was able to attend. Yeah. <laughs> because it was being held via Zoom, you know? And, and so the access issue, I think, is an important part of that as well. But um, let, let me shift gears here a little bit. Um, artificial intelligence, automation, that sort of thing, has it been accelerated because of the pandemic with people not being able to, to come together as much? And yeah. I mean, what's your take on that? Well, from what, I, what I've been reading is that's what's been a huge acceleration, technology. Uh, the need is accelerate people, uh, businesses spend more money because people are working remotely. Uh, the ability to now interact with, you know, and we, and we always had that ability to interact with London, but now you're interacting with multiple offices and, and doing what you need to do where you, you're you spending so much time out there, but there's much more expenditures been going, much more expenses been put towards. A lot of companies were putting off doing what they need to do, uh, whether it was computer systems, but because of this, they've had to spend the money. And you know, we've heard about artificial intelligence for a while, uh, but you're starting to see that more in manufacturing automation because they saw what happened to the product production, how a employee you know, in, a, in, a, in a facility, in a production facility, could, this could happen. How would they move going forward? So that you're still see, continue to see this investment spend. It's one area of technology that's just gonna continue to go, go nuts. And that's why you're seeing the stock market for technology going crazy. So. 
Okay, the next question is about something that you touched on a little bit before about unemployment benefits. And if you thought that these um, benefits and maybe other uh, social assistance programs, if that is going to have a negative effect on the economy um, in the long run. I don't think in the long run, I think in the sh it's short term. We're seeing it short term. I, I think in the long run, um, it is, I mean, the one good thing is come, coming out of this, you're seeing a higher uh, hourly rate. You're seeing companies now, you know, there is stuff being put in place with governments about a, a higher um, minimum wage. But what's happened is the need for employees, these companies are, are raising the rates. I'm starting to see where it used to be a $10 job. Now they're offering $13. So I think in the short term, it has affected getting, you know, employees back to work. Long term, I think it will, will benefit the employee. I have benefit uh, unemployment that they'll, they'll, they realize they've got to come in higher than what the employment uh, benefits are. So the market is adapting. It finds ways to, yeah. to adapt to the, to the demands of the market and supply. But it's, it's things or no, they could have done before. Companies can afford it, but they didn't until they're, they're, they were pushed. You know, until they were pushed, did they really make any change? And that's what's happening in a lot of these trends. And I think that's a good segue to the next question that was asked. You alluded to this within the presentation, talking quite a bit about the importance of small business and how really that is the backbone of the economy. But we've seen an acceleration of the trend where perhaps big chains are moving in and putting pressure and sometimes putting small businesses out of business. Uh, what do you think the best solution would be for small businesses? You know, the, the mom and pop store trying to, to compete with the chain that's moving in. Is there a way to compete or is this just kind of an inevitable change? Well, it's, it's kind of, again, adapting. Small businesses that adapt to areas that are not being served. Um, I think you're seeing, and it's been a trend that's happening for a while now, obviously, the Walmarts of the world, the Home Depots, uh, getting rid of a lot of small hardware stores. Um, I don't know if there's a way to change that because then you're, you're, you're basically affecting growth. You're affecting uh, the, the chance for companies. Um, I do know that you're seeing a lot more unique businesses coming about, microbreweries, things that are really kind of touch on, on local prosperity. And I think that is where small business owners are getting smarter. They're, they're realizing that I'm going to tap something that's a need. And, and I mean, I, I got to tell you, we were talking about this off camera. I'm opening a business here that is a wedding venue. And it's an area that is a country area. And, and I did research and knew that people in Virginia Beach were traveling to Richmond and, and uh, to um, and, and use my classes to do research too, to travel to Charlottesville because there wasn't this type of venue. So you have to be original in how you're thinking uh, and I think that's what continue. I don't think we'll be able to move unless there's legislation that comes about that you'll continue to have these companies get bigger and bigger. But there's always that micro or that basically specialty store that can thrive, continue to thrive. It's just going to evolve and change. So, right. So you mentioned uh, generations, Gen X. Gen X are right here. Uh, millennials, uh, the boomer generation, and uh, the trends that, you know, were created by the different generations. Some of it was uh, driven by um, baby boom during uh, time of world wars and that, that sort of thing. Yeah. And how's the pandemic going to affect this? I mean, how's the baby bust going to affect the economy, you know, 15, 20 years from now? Well, I think, I think you, look at, you look at from a standpoint of millennials. Millennials, for the most part, came from baby boomers, you know, for the mm -hmm. most part. Uh, my children are 21 and my kids are 21, 25. So they're right in that area. Uh, I'm 58. I'm at the end of, uh, of a baby boomer. You look at how much they, they push that needle. You know, that was a huge segment, how much they changed the economy. And that's why I look at for millennials, that millennials have a, a different thought process, much more socially conscious, much more. And they are starting to affect the politics. They haven't gotten there yet. But I think from a standpoint of where, uh, millennials will, will they're, they're right there in that 25 to 40 affecting how work is being done. So I think you're pushing towards more remote. The need for um, a lot of the, they've done a lot of self startups. The whole internet business has been started by really millennials from a standpoint of what they've done. So 
I think that that is a whole new area that's pushing things. And what you'll watch millennials as they continue to, to now to be 40 years old is, is unbelievable. But that is also millennials having kids. So you're seeing that trend and then moving out of cities, going to the suburbs, realizing that they want something different. But what we're really seeing, I didn't bring this up, uh, you could really see a trend with small schools, small, small uh, colleges, and how if small colleges go under, which there's been a lot of talk about a number of small colleges, you could see that real estate turning into basically these micro communities. And from a standpoint of people that are looking to live in, in, in tight communities and small colleges give that. So that's another trend. I really didn't talk about that much, but from a standpoint of how we're affected from an education standpoint moving forward and how the need to evolve there as well. If I could just uh, add that one of our speakers a little later in the series is uh, our chief of staff, uh, Dr. Jeffrey McClurkin, and he's going to talk a little bit about the future of, of higher ed in the wake of the pandemic. So. So the next question kind of circles back to one of the previous questions to the topic of small businesses. Um, and do you think that uh, remote work and this trend towards more remote work um, will impact small businesses as well as large businesses? Well, unfortunately from a business standpoint, you, a small business might have five to 25 employees and it depends on that area. Um, it depends on what type of business they have, but it, it remote work really kind of works from a larger standpoint, production, a larger uh, company standpoint for the most part, because the, the, the roles are defined. And you think a small business, people play several roles at once. So to me, it always depends on the type of business. Could it be remote or not? A lot of those small businesses are local communities. So they have the interaction with the community. Um, but there's also that area where they're doing internet fulfillment. They're, they've, they've, they've used this time during COVID to really branch their products out. I just think from a small business, because you're playing so many roles, it's harder to be a remote. It's, it's really, for me, standpoint, you know, you're really fulfilling that local community more than anything. That's good. Now, the next question has to do with housing. And you've touched on this in terms of some of the trends regarding, you know, moving from urban population, uh, population centers to other areas, the, the trends, especially within the millennials, looking for a different kind of community to be living in. But if you could speak a little bit to how COVID has impacted housing, I mean, certainly we look at interest rates and realtors are certainly benefiting right now. And it seems like a, a, a real growth for, for them. Where do you see this going over the next six months or a year? Well, I think it, from what I've, from what I've read, um, a couple factors. One, interest rates, all-time low. People saying, uh, cooped up in apartments. People going, oh my gosh, I've got to get out. I, I've lived in this apartment too long, especially during COVID, and the, and the desire to have more space. Uh, also, it's, it's, it's interesting because lumber prices. Lumber prices have shot up so high. I think there were 20 mills around the country. There are now five because of COVID. A lot of them shut down. There's also the issue about a lot of where we get our, our wood from is from Canada. A lot of it from the hearsay is, is that sitting at the border. And industry, you know, mills have said, hey, we can charge, you know, for, I mean, I just, believe me, I just checked on plywood. I think plywood was $59. It used to be, I think it was 32 So you think about how price increases on this and saying, hey, we get a top dollar and not bring as much in. So that supply demand, let's go ahead and really jack this up. Um, so I think it's a, I think it's so a factor. I think people really realize that apartment living, I, this was the time to move. If, I, if we're gonna do it, let me do it now. Um, and just inventory, inventory, because there's, there's not new construction going on. A lot of that you've seen too is a lot of the cities have closed down because of COVID. So permits weren't being approved, delays and all that stuff. So. Uh, you don't see new, new construction nearly as it was before. It's really slowed down. Going forward, we'll probably get back up, but it's gonna, that's going to be, if the city um, municipalities are the ones that are slow to get back up, as we're seeing. I was on a city call this morning, so I know <laughs> how slow it's been. So what happens if, a, if there's a, 
second wave. Um, I know there's there's some you know some uh, discussion. I'm sure we'll hear it later when we hear Claudine Farrell talk about the Spanish flu and how we've responded to other disasters. But there's um, there's some history of the Spanish flu coming back in a second wave. Yeah. What you know? How are we ready for that? What what happens if there's a second wave? Well, well, yeah, because we really haven't talked about if there's a if we're going to have to do a, a, a third shot. You know, are we going to need a third shot? How long is this really good for? And it, it definitely couldn't come back. I, I the, unfortunately, and you're seeing this. You saw this people saying, "I've had enough of this. I, I'm not going to." Uh, to go back in, uh, and and I remember on the Spanish flu, I think there was four waves to the Spanish flu because of people what they're willing to do the first time versus the second time, third time. I I, I can't begin to wonder what would happen. I mean, I I, I don't think uh, that people are going to be listening as well as they did the first time. I think people will continue to um, to do what they want. It will shut down our economy again. Uh, you saw the things that really were growing during that time uh, through COVID. I mean, businesses that were thriving. Um, but I can't begin to guess what would happen if we've gone through another wave. I really can't. I can't imagine us going in the fall. God, I got to get back to the classroom. I can't stay on Zoom. It's just going to, you know. So, so you know, um, I don't even want to think about that, Keith, you know. So, So here's some more, another question about unpredictable things. Um, gas prices, they were down low during the pandemic. Nobody was driving. They've shot back up. Um, well, some of that was due to that pipeline problem. But what, what do you think about the future of gas prices? Well, and, 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 and again, I'm not trying to get into politics because I'm not a Republican or a Democrat. I like to kind of be right in the middle uh, certain things I agree, but you normally see when a Democratic leader takes uh, takes over, the gas prices will shoot up. Uh, we also closed down a pipeline. Uh, we closed down uh, the pipeline up up to I think it was uh, North Dakota or South Dakota. So you see the demand, and now people getting back out there. Uh, people are getting back; they're traveling again. So therefore, gas prices are going to shoot up. That's just demand versus. You know, and I think they always call it the transferring over to summer gas versus winter uh, fuel. So, but from a standpoint of people traveling more, it's a chance to shoot it back up. And I think this is what plays into every year uh, that we see, especially the beginning of the summer. So anybody who's thought at all about refinancing their house has heard some great news lately. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, interest rates are just at rock bottom. Um, I mean, how long is this going to continue? Um, and is, is this the right thing for right now to help us with recovery? What are your thoughts? Well, I mean, we saw the worry about inflation a couple of weeks ago. The stock market took a big dive. OK, and then all of a sudden we, we, we were out of inflation. Now, all of a sudden, we're not going to be worried about inflation. So you look how touchy the stock market is. So from a standpoint of interest rates, I, I think in order in terms of to get, continue to get everybody back on their feet, I think they've got to stay low. I don't think, I think if they turn around and made an adjustment now, it would totally be counterproductive to what they're trying to do. And that's get the economy rolling. And it's the weird part about all this is the stock market's been all time highs, but that's for certain sectors. I mean, you really look at areas that really need help and, uh, and also that's concerning about unemployment. Are, are we getting people back to work? I think, and are the jobs going to be there? I think that's a major shift that we'll see. Are the jobs really going to be there? Uh, and the typical jobs, it's going to be a lot of probably training of, of employees doing new functions and new things as things become more automated. Uh, areas that are not so reliant on people, they realize they learned this that they had to not be so reliant. So I, I can't see interest rates going up right now. Then again, um, but I also can't see them. I, I, to me, I think you're probably looking at another six months before things really, uh, they talk about maybe putting interest rates back up. But yeah, refinance now, why not? <laughs> Get it in where you can, right? That's yeah. Exactly. <laughs>
Now, there's another question in the in the queue about the urban exodus, people moving from the cities. Uh, in the question they're asking, is it really about moving from the major metropolitan centers to smaller cities, or is it to the countryside? And you alluded to this and talked about some incentives. And yeah. you know, it might be helpful for us in this part of the country, especially to think about D.C. How do you see that impacting Northern Virginia, D.C., and coming down through the rest of Virginia? Well, I remember, you know, when I went to school back in the 80s at Mary Washington, you know, Fredericksburg was a sleepy little town, you know, and it still is in some ways, but you come back now and you see so many people commuting from D.C. down to Fredericksburg. So that shift to where they used to live in the suburbs, the suburbs are now down to Fredericksburg. Um, and, you know, you see the number of people jumping on the train in the morning to go up to D.C. or, or do the commute. Uh, you've just seen this continued expanse of, of, of the suburbs. Now, people working remotely, how will that affect and where they could live? Um, you know, it, it is, the millennials are definitely moving out as they get older because having children, you're seeing that in thirties and everything. Now that trend was already starting to happen, but it accelerated with COVID. Now will people start going back to the cities? You look at it and it was always an issue I had in LA. I had people that worked for me making good money. So they made in LA, you know, a, a, a good salary might be 85,000, you know, in LA. But what did that mean? They're, they're renting a place for $2,900, 3,000 a month for an apartment. And people are starting to realize I'm going to move elsewhere, make 65,000 and be ahead of the game. I might, you know what, because the big cost is living, is living cost is, is, is housing. And I think that reality of saying, you know, I can not have such a commute, pay lower taxes. And I think this is where some major cities are really going along. Uh, you're seeing an exodus in LA with businesses, people moving to Texas. Texas used to be Colorado. Now they're moving to Texas out of LA. High tax rate, you're paying a 12% state tax. You know, you're paying at a higher level uh, for everything. And they're just saying, I can do this in another city. Uh, and my job is not so dependent upon this as well to be here. And I, I really do think that's the shift. I think the shift is cities have got to get smarter. Uh, their, their prices seem to be increasing. Uh, it's a tougher way of life too. You know, uh, if you live in a, a, a place like LA, it's, it's the transportation, public transportation is not very good. So you have to have a car. Uh, you really have to schedule your time of where you go because it could take you anywhere from an hour on. So really looking at um, just a, a different way of life. And I think millennials are all about that too, at a different way of life. All right, well, Professor Dan Wolf, thank you so, so much for this. This was really, really a great way to kick us off here on this five week course. Uh, this discussion of business and how it's changed uh, has been an enlightening for me and very, very interesting. I really appreciate it very much, um, your participation in the course. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us this afternoon. As a reminder, we do have a session on Thursday. The same link to get into Zoom works um, for, the, for the Tuesday session and the Thursday session. So you can click on that same link. Uh, our speakers on Thursday are Marissa Martinez-Mira and Gonzalo campos Dintras, who uh, were, are speaking about language rights in the wake of COVID-19. Uh, should be a fascinating presentation as well. Mary Washington students, if you are an incoming student and you're participating in the uh, discussion groups, be sure to log out of the webinar and click on the link sent to you by Professor Rao uh, for getting into those small group discussions. Those will begin in about two or three minutes. If you're a continuing student, remember that we're asking you to participate in the discussions in the Learning Management System Canvas. So uh, any technical issues, email myself or Dr. Rao and we'll try to get that worked out with you in the next couple of minutes if you're having trouble getting into any of those, those sessions. Uh, thank you all very much for joining us. We'll look forward to seeing you on Thursday for our talk on language rights in the wake of COVID-19. Thank you all, have a great evening. Thank you, Professor Wolf. Thank you.